and welcome to a brand new series. This is the Sports Bite Show. I'm Andy Sixsmith, and with Sports Bite having a reputation to uphold as the voice of sport in Sunderland, we have got a packed episode lined up for you. This is what's coming up. And after making its British debut at the London Olympics last year, handball has continued to enjoy somewhat of a renaissance in popularity in this country. We'll be chatting to Sunderland's Jack Woods, who is aiming to make the sport a force to be reckoned with at the university. And from one minority sport to another, this week's Minority Minute feature will focus on table tennis, and specifically two men who appear to enjoy being at a numerical disadvantage. Well, from the sports hall to the golf course, Andrew McDonald, golf president for Sunderland University, will be coming into the studio to talk through the team's recent successes and just why the sport is so popular in this country. And if all that isn't enough to whet your sporting appetite, we also have an exclusive interview with Sunderland youth swimming coach Craig Robertson, and we'll also be welcoming our resident Geordie in Sunderland, Matt Smith, into the studio to talk through all of the region's football news. So, I did tell you we've got an awful lot coming up, so let's get cracking then, shall we? Well, it's been a fantastic few weeks of sport in and around Sunderland University, despite the bad weather almost bringing an end to the fixture list, and because we're a nice bunch here at Sports Bite, and we know you love to keep up to date. Here's a roundup of all of the latest important fixtures and results. And let's start with basketball, and especially the men's first. They defeated Leeds 62-59 to pull six points clear of the drop zone in their league. But their performance was pretty much eclipsed by the men's second team, who defeated local rivals Northumbria 60 points to 54 in an enthralling encounter at City Space to cement second place in the league. It was end-to-end -end stuff right towards the, uh, the finish line, and with most of the team graduating this year, they were understandably delighted with the result. Uh, well, basically, that puts us in second place guaranteed, and barring like, something goes wrong, we're second place now, which, from what I've seen, is the best result for any men's basketball team in the past eight years, and the best result for the men's second team since it started. With my first two years, we won two games combined, so this is a massive achievement to go five and one. And the fact we did it ourselves, extra sessions, paying for it out of our own pocket, we only get one 7 a.m. session a week. So we really worked hard for this, yeah. though, and it's, I'm proud of everyone for pulling it out of the bag in the end. Five and one! But well, what the men can do, the women can do just as well. Their team beat Sheffield Seconds 50 points to 38. But the women's football team again stole the headlines. They continued their seemingly unstoppable march towards the title with a resounding 7-2 win over Sheffield to go further clear at the top of their league. Now where there's good news, there inevitably has to be a little bit of bad news. And that really came with the men's football. Their first team lost 3-1 to Northumbria thirds, and there was absolute heartbreak for our men's football second team, who lost 3-2 in the final of the Northern Plate Conference Cup to Sheffield in Sheffield. Yes, that's right, to Sheffield in Sheffield. Home advantage there for the Yorkshiremen. And it appears that Sunderland don't really enjoy a knockout competition. Our golfing team fell to a three and a half to two and a half point defeat to Newcastle Uni first in the semi-finals of the Conference League Cup. So we'll be speaking to Andrew McDonald, golf president, about that in a minute. But that is you up to date completely with all of the latest news and headlines from the sporting fixtures around the university. Well, I think it's about time for our first studio guest of the series and our first exclusive interview. And it's been an excellent time of late for British golf. Rory McIlroy has shot to the top of the world rankings and has also improved his timekeeping abilities since the Ryder Cup team's miracle of Medina. So it seems a rather good time for the golf to take off at Sunderland University. And a big part of that is golf president Andrew McDonald. Andrew, welcome to the Sports Bite Show. Thank you for coming on. Um, I think we have to start with last week, don't we? That defeat by Newcastle first in the semi-final of a cup. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, obviously it was very disappointing. Um, we were unlucky in the f that we had to run into Newcastle first in before the final as such, but um, we actually gave it a pretty good go. And for a large part of the game, we actually looked like 
we possibly could manage to get the result. But um, they're a good side in the top of the league for a reason. Um, they dug in there and came through right right at the end, uh, as it turned out. But uh, everyone was quite proud of the effort that we gave. And like I say, they're top of the league and they're, they're winning everything. They haven't been beaten, so they're a good side. So. Well, like you say, top of the league, you're up against. Yeah. What sort of a learning experience was that for your, you and your team? I think it was more... Uh, the fact that the team's been put together this year, um, not really sure where we were going to go, how we were going to sort of get on, and um, it kind of proved to everyone that we're actually a pretty good side, and and we've actually come quite a long way in a short space of time, um, because their their team were full of third years, and they'd been together for three years, yeah. a lot of them. Yeah. Um, we've bumped into them a few times. They've got three teams in our league, so see the same faces and. It kind of, sh I think it kind of gave us a big boost that we're going in the right direction, yeah. and, and certainly we can aim for next year, um, just to keep building and, and maybe go one step further next year. So. Well, that's the thing. It's all about this building process, isn't it? You've obviously got a young team there. What sort of things can you actually learn from that defeat to take into next year? Uh, probably how to hang I on to a lead. Losing, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> how to hang on to a lead, I suppose, is um, probably one of the main things, but. Um, I guess the guys that were in front and kind of got pegged back, it, it's more just being in that situation and knowing how to deal with it better next time. Um, playing a little bit safer maybe, playing just making your opponent have to do something yeah. special in term, in, instead of you making a mistake to kind of let them back in, um, things like that. But overall, good experience and a good run in the cup and it's kind of brought all the team together a bit more. And yeah. I said, look forward to the future, certainly. Well, definitely. I mean, it's it's sometimes the case when a team enjoy a good cup run, yeah. the league form tails off a little bit. You've still got three fixtures left this season. Yeah. What are your thoughts ahead of those? Um, actually, I think the cup's actually benefited away in the fact that when when league games have been being cancelled and that the, the Cups actually managed to keep it together, keep it playing and uh, and strangely, like you say, sometimes it uh, can go the other way but we've mm. actually enjoyed a, a good run of form since November time. We didn't start too well and uh, we've managed to get ourselves up to second in the league now and three games left, a couple of tough games, we'll play Newcastle first again but if we could manage to finish second obviously with the semi-final that we achieved that would be a, pretty good start for a first year together. Well, hopefully. I mean, we're looking yeah. forward to the yeah. future and uh, seeing what that holds for yeah. uh, Sunderland University golf. But as I touched upon before, it's a fantastic time at the minute, isn't it, for British yeah. golf? We can't really go through this entire interview without talking about the miracle of Medina. Um, what are your thoughts reflecting back on that one? Uh, I'm still not quite sure how, how it happened, to be fair. <laughs> um, she's sort of sitting there Saturday night, two games left on the course. And it was kind of a foregone conclusion, if you like, and then, and then a little bit of magic on Saturday night, and all of a sudden there's a bit of a buzz seemed to, seemed to transpire through the TV as well. Everybody yeah. sort of seemed to pick it up together, and uh, what happened on Sunday was uh, it will probably never happen anything in that will happen again. So. And a lot of spirit shown by uh, yeah. Ian Poulter to name but one. Yeah, I think that's why it's great for British golf because if you look at even that team, um, the European team, it was the comeback was kind of. Um, instigated by the British guys, yeah. the, the spirit and the, the sort of passion of the British guys and they're the people obviously we're looking up to and, sure. and trying to aspire to. So, yeah. But Andrew, thank you for coming no on the show. Best of luck for the future. I'm sure this isn't the last we'll be seeing you on the Sports Bike Show. Right. Thank, thank you. you very much. Well, what swimming wouldn't give for even half the success that the British golfers have had over the years. And despite some ups and downs on a national scale, the sport has continued to go through somewhat of a purple patch in the region and the City of Sunderland Swim Club are a huge part of that. I jogged along to the Aquatic Centre this week to talk to their youth coach Craig Robertson about the emergence of the team. It's been a topsy-turvy journey for the City of Sunderland Swim Club in recent years but the squad is quite firmly on a high at the moment, even more recognisable when you think of the problems British swimming has been encountering, a poor Olympics and loss of key personnel, among others. And Craig Robertson is a key figure behind that emergence of Sunderland as a national force. So Craig, there's only really one place to start at the minute with British swimming, and that is the news over the last few weeks of the appointments of Chris Spice as the new national performance director, and then Bill Furness as the new head coach. 
that obviously was tempered with Rebecca Adlington retiring, but let's start on the appointments. What were your thoughts on those arrivals? Um, I think it's a great move. Firstly, I know what the coach will agree as well, that it's kind of a move that everybody wanted. I think personally, it's pretty swimming wise, that would be pretty successful with people like that. Well, we do hope so, but unfortunately with British swimming, whenever there's good news, there's always disappointment right round the corner. And that came in the form of Rebecca Adlington retiring at the ripe old age of 23. What are your thoughts on her retirement? I think it's been a shock for a few people. Um, I'd be expected by others, but I think in the event, like you say, not a lot of the young kids coming through, developing a lot of Americans and Chinese coming through. Maybe the right move, but personally, from a role model perspective, I'm doing really well. Hopefully, bring the sport on to other areas. I agree, she couldn't have done much more than she did over her career, could she? Well, over to you, University Swimmers, indeed. And thank you to Craig for allowing us to access his training session and for that interview. We wish them the best of luck for the rest of the season. OK, then, let's dry ourselves off a little bit, shall we? And let's head over to our first Minority Minute of the series. Each week, we take a different minority sport at the university and ask one of their team members to explain that sport in detail, but in one minute. Hence, the ingenuity of the title. Minority Minute. With us, well, I'm sure you'll pick it up somewhere along the line. This week, we focus on table tennis, and specifically, two men who appear to enjoy playing at a numerical disadvantage each week. Over to you, Ahmed. Hello, my name is Ahmed Heikal. Uh, I'm playing table tennis for 16 years. Uh, I am 21 years old now. Uh, I have been playing and, and loving the game since I was young, four years old, uh, Sunderland University helped me a lot to play and practice and uh, give me the opportunity to play and practice every day. Uh, I've took the third place in the box competition last year uh, and I hope to, to do better this year. Uh, table tennis is, n is not only a uh, sport, it's, it's about thinking and uh, sensitive. Uh, it's difficult to play table tennis because it needs more practice, more fitness. Uh, you have to put your goals in front of you to, to achieve what you want. It's not easy, but it's, I, I love this. I love these sports, and I hope everyone can, can play it and enjoy it. Okay then, great enthusiasm shown there by Ahmed, and well done to him for being top three in books. That is some achievement. I feel like I must explain, every week, it seems like, Ahmed and his teammates play one man short against the various university teams, which in itself is a fantastic achievement. So if you're watching this, Ahmed, Sports by do offer our services to your table tennis team, but uh, if you've seen any of us play table tennis, you're probably better off continuing by yourself. Well, from one minority sport to another, and with 2012, it was all about Olympic Super Saturday, it was about Andy Murray's maiden Grand Slam. It was about the miracle of Medina and that fantastic climax to the end of the Premier League season. But the greatest year since sport began was also about the sports that receive less recognition than others. Step forward, handball. And to introduce the sport at Sunderland University, step forward, Jack Woods. Our reporter, Luke Summers, has this. Sunderland University hosted a beginner's guide to handball on Saturday with the aim of showcasing the sport to a wider audience. New goalposts and hall markings were used for the first time as the Newcastle Vikings came to the city to play an exhibition match against the university side. The home side competed well but lost by 15 points to 9 and then were also defeated 11-9 by the Vikings female side. But captain Jack Woods was pleased with the experience. We did pretty well. I think we only got beat by four on the first game and we got yeah. beat by like two in the second. I mean, we played the girls in the second game, but uh, even the Newcastle Vikings guys said their girls team are their strongest team. So I think we did pretty well. And I'm really quite proud of the guys, considering it's like, I think two of the guys had never played handball before and like the rest of the team had only played their two competitive games before. So it's, it's really good for the team. And I think they've really enjoyed it. And it's been a real big morale boost that they've held, like they've held the score quite low. Cause I think, the ex expectations they were going to get absolutely hammered and they came and they actually pulled out stops and considering the games they've played it's been really good for them. 
After the Games were over, there was a chance for beginners to come and have a go at the sport, which has seen a huge rise in popularity since the Olympics. Vikings players were on hand to lend their expertise and work on some basic drills. And Woods encourages more people to come and give the sport a go. I would just say, I would say come down on uh, come down on Sundays six to eight. That's when all our trainers, it's girls and boys. So we're going to get mixed trains together. It's a really really good workout. It's a very physical game and it's really fast. It's just really fun to play. And I think it needs the publicity. So this hopefully is the the springboard for more things to come. Well, thank you to Luke for that special report. And funnily enough, we actually have Jack Woods in the studio with us tonight. Jack. Thank you for coming on the Sports Bite Show. Thank you for bringing the glorious sport that is handball to our university. And, uh, well, there's going to be a lot of our viewers who don't really know too much about the sport. Why don't you start by telling us a little bit about handball? Well, handball is almost like a cross between basketball and football. You basically throw a ball, a small rubber ball, into a goal. Good. <laughs> yeah. It's a pretty, pretty simple concept to grasp. It's a bit more... It's a bit more complicated than that but basically that's kind of what it is it's quite a physical game it's very fast mm. and yeah okay well apart from throwing the ball into the goal uh what do you love so much about the sport i love the speed of it and the ferocity of it i like getting right in there and i don't even i don't care that it's it's quite it's almost quite violent in defense it's a lot of people think when they first see it they think oh it's a non-contact sport almost like basketball but yeah. It's said, it's said it's semi-contact, but sometimes it can get pretty, pretty hectic if you play it. Well, I won't ask you to elaborate on that, no. but um, you've set the team up here at Sunderland University. How much interest have you had so far? <clears throat> We've had quite a bit. We had, we had a lot of people sign up for it at Freshers' Fair, and all the people that signed up, I think, came on the, uh, on the um, try-it days. Good. Uh, we have a squad of about 15 at the moment, mm. and we've got... After the current influx of uh, internationals after Christmas, we've got quite a few more players, like international players. We've got some Germans. Great. In. So <laughs> it's always good for a handball team to have a few Germans in there. Well, how much scope do you think that there is for development of handball at the university? I mean, let's leave aside funding, but let's talk about that interest in the sport currently and where it can go here at Sunderland. Well, like, it's going to looking to be books next year but i think we just had uni championships and books were there and they were looking over the sport and thinking oh this could be yeah quite a new thing for us right. um so like at the university we'll have northumbria and newcastle university here as well mm. so that will probably be a books group for us and hopefully we'll get the team in books next year and we'll be playing regular games every single week and hopefully we'll make city space into a <laughs> handballing place in the next year. Handball hopefully. Fortress, I exactly. like the sound like that. of that one. Yeah, like something like St James's Park. I yeah. didn't say that. Um, well, there's been great news recently for handball, hasn't there? The IOC have announced that in the 2020 games that handball is going to be one of those 25 core sports. Yeah. What do you think the Team GB can do to prepare for that? I think we've got to really push the youth programme and I think bringing the sport in at a grassroots level, like teaching it as primary school children will be the key yeah. because if it's pointless really getting people in their teens to really get into it. Maybe people who've done basketball and such because it's a bit of a crossover. You can kind of work between the two. I certainly did. <laughs> and uh, But I think if we bring it in very, very, like to very younger audience, mm. they can they can grow with it and they can sort of mature with the sport yeah. where it hasn't had that before and it's just sort of random people getting into it. Yeah. I think if you, get, if you start small, big things will come. Okay, right, finally, and I promise this is going to be the final question and we'll let you go. There's going to be a lot of viewers, like I say, who don't really know a lot about the sport. This is your big recruitment chance, Jack. Grasp it with both hands. <laughs> what would you say to those people to get them along to City Space and training with you guys? I would say you should really try a new sport out and it's, it's growing in popularity. You should try something that is going to be the next big thing here. Well, I believe it's going to be the next big thing in England. <laughs> I mean, basketball 20 years ago was nothing really. Now we have, now there's a professional basketball league yeah. in, in England. So hopefully that, that's going to be like what's going to happen yeah. with handball. I hope, hopefully, I'm not making any <laughs> promises, but every, but everyone should come and try this. It's a really fast sport. Even people who like, it's a bit aggressive sometimes, don't get me wrong, but like hopefully that can appeal to some 
sports nuts out there who like their sort of rugby and stuff. But anyone really can play. It's it's quite an easy sport to get into. Yeah. It doesn't require an amazing set of skills to play. It's yeah. just quite fun. OK, well, that was pretty good recruitment for sure. Uh, the next big thing, though, we're going to have to hold you to that one. Best of luck for the future, Jack. That'll do us for today. But uh, best of luck for the rest of the season in getting people along to handball. And also, uh, we look forward to welcoming you back onto the show with two or three handball teams underneath you if it's going to be the next big thing. Thank but you. thank you again, Jack. OK, well, that's almost time up for this week, but there are still a couple of minutes left. So what I suggest is we do a roundup of all of the latest regional football news. And to do so, I think we need a rather special person. Making his debut on the Sports Bite show, he is our resident Geordie in Sunderland. He is the editor of the blog ElasticoChop.com. Plug. He is Matt Smith. Thanks very much, Andy. OK, so coming up on today's football roundup, we've got a very happy David Santon. We've got the Amiobi brothers, who've done a fantastic job, although it's unsurprisingly off the pitch. And we've got Marco Pierre White at the Stadium of Light, but not to replace Stefan Sessignon, but in fact, to teach John O'Shea and Phil Bardsley how to cook. Perhaps try defending first, lads? OK, so getting straight on to the David Santon piece. The Chronicle reporting, I won't be joining my pal Mario in Serie A. Mario, of course, being Mario Balotelli, who recently signed for AC Milan in the January transfer window. But David Santon insists even the lure to team up with close pal Mario Balotelli at AC Milan would not persuade him to quit his beloved Newcastle United. So great news there for Geordies, although the transfer window was a month ago and no one's really talking about it anymore. Santon also goes on to say the Premier League is better than Serie A and better than in La Liga. The fans here are the best. You're too kind, David. Moving straight over to the Chronicles article, Shola and Sami Amiobi help open new sports facility. It seems while the French Revolution take control of matters on the pitch, the Amiobi brothers are doing their bit off it. Recently opened up the brand new Walker Activity Dome. Shola has commented on it saying, the new facilities are absolutely brilliant. I think back to this when I was a kid growing up around here and we didn't have anything like this. Well, we'd never guess Shola, we'd never guess. Why is Marco Pierre White at Sunland? I, I hear his cry. Well, it's for another instalment of Marco's Black Cat Kitchen, of course. The, to, this, this year's uh, pros are going to be Phil Bardsley and John O'Shea, who are taking on the challenge this year. Phil Bardsley's commented saying, it was fantastic to cook with a chef of the calibre of Marco. And Marco Pierre White has said, I am looking forward to coming back to Sunland for this and seeing how the players handle the heat of the kitchen service. Relegation worries? What relegation worries? Not only has John O'Shea been trying his luck in the kitchen, he's also been given his non-biased opinion on Sunderland strike force Danny Graham and Stephen Fletcher. O'Shea has gone on to say they definitely show they can work together. They're intelligent footballers, not just finishers, and that bodes well for Sunderland's up-and-coming games. So if no one else has got your back, boys, one goal in 51 games John O'Shea has at least. Moving on again after the hype that John O'Shea has gave him, Danny Graham has said that he feels right at home at Sunderland. Making it clear yet again that he is not unhappy at Sunderland and besides the comments that he made earlier, he is completely happy in Sunderland. Don't worry. Moving on to a little bit of transfer news now. Celtic defender Effie Ambrose has been linked with Sunderland recently with Neil Lennon commenting and saying, I don't think we'll lose him in the summer as he's just in the door and there's much more he can add to his game. But he's got a few admirers out there with his performances last season. Not anybody who watched the Juventus game, I would think. Some great news though for Sunderland here, as James McFadden has decided to leave the club, deciding to go back to Motherwell to get some first team action. The striker said, I need to get back playing competitive first team football and this is the best place for me. Well, you said it James, not me. And finally, to summarise on Newcastle, Tim Crowell has been quoted saying, Newcastle want to eclipse the class of 69. Tim Crowell has revealed that the current Newcastle United team are hell-bent on finally taking away the class of 69's tag of the last Magpies side to win a trophy. Crowell obviously speaking ahead of Newcastle United's European clash against Metalist Kharkiv. The United number one has told the Chronicle today, you look around the dressing room and it is so hungry for success. 
Somebody better call John O'Shea and Phil Bardsley quick, eh? OK, well, with my producer frantically waving her hands about off camera, I think she's trying to tell me that it is unfortunately time up for this week. But many thanks to my guests for coming on, for Matt Smith for his regional football roundup, to Jack Woods from Handball, Andrew McDonald from Golf, and of course to Craig Robertson and his City of Sunderland swim squad. And lastly, but by no means least, thank you to you for watching. I have been Andy Sixsmith, this has been the Sports Bite Show, and we'll see your pretty faces next time. Bye for now.